turn the recording on because these are videotaped and they are put on our website, jonesdo.com under Zoom Rock Room uh, within an hour after we get off the air tonight. And they're all there if you want to go back and archive anything that we've uh, done uh, or, or rewatch or watch a the show or if you didn't participate in the quiz last time we met uh that was a fun time uh i think everybody learned something so anyway um anybody have anything out there you want to say uh to the room or to us i'll give you the chance to chat in here right now if you want to say anything to the room We love having all you uh, folks joining us uh, almost every time uh, you can. We're up to 30 people right now. That's a good average. Coming in November, I may be doing, we may be doing a Zoom rock room live from Arizona for you. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure exactly our departure date yet, but uh, looks like maybe the first two in November. Uh, I may be in Arizona someplace. <laughs> so we'll see how that pans out. Okay. We will move on here then. And I'm going to uh, kind of introduce to us our speaker tonight. He, I kind of roped him into doing something educational for us. Um, I've used a company called GeoView for several different projects. And Peter actually has been the uh, technician that's been with me most of the time. And uh, at our, after our last project that he did for us, uh, I I uh, proposed this idea of doing a ground penetrating radar because uh, uh, I don't think a lot of people understand what GPR does or what it, how important it is. Uh, very very important for us. What what we found. Out at Marianne Furnace before the kids got there, we had a lot of GPR data that gave us uh, some good ideas about maybe where to put squares down this year. So uh, anyway, uh, Peter Weston is, of course, uh, employed as a project geophysicist for GeoView. And uh, he's, he's worked in the field of geophysics for 10 years and have conducted GPR surveys over a wide variety of sites, including cemeteries, archeologically, and the new construction, including the World Trade Center Memorial. And uh, obviously uh, numerous sinkholes, there's another reason to do GPR. And even in a six foot forced sewer main, I may wanna hear more about that uh, sort of thing. So he graduated with a BA in uh, in Near Eastern Archaeology and a minor in Geology. And uh, if anything else he wants to pass on to us, he will do that during his program. So, Peter Weston, thank you for joining us tonight. And you are on stage and go ahead. All right. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Jerry. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Um, and good evening everyone i uh hope uh hope by the end of the evening you'll be able to weigh or be able to walk away knowing a thing or two about uh ground penetrating radar so um let me see here let me get my screen shared so you can see the slideshow that i have Okay. So, <clears throat> so what is ground penetrating radar? Um, as with all the techniques within the uh, field of geophysics, it's a non-invasive geophysical method uh, which uses pulses of electromagnetic energy uh, to assess subsurface conditions. Um, the reflections are caused by changes in the signal velocity uh, at interfaces of materials with different electrical properties. Uh, the greater the contrast, the higher uh, 
the amplitude of the reflected return. Now, I realize that it sounds rather dry and I don't worry, I'll, I'll get back into it uh, <laughs> in just a minute, but actually um, I wanna take a, take a step back and uh, actually touch on some history of where um, basically what the roots of uh, ground penetrating radar are. So um, in a nutshell, so it actually, the history goes back further than I actually realized um, when I was first looking into uh, doing research for this talk. Um, basically, back in the uh, back in 1886 to 1888, Heinrich Hertz was um, doing experiments uh, where he proved the existence of electromagnetic waves and found that they would pass through some materials and then also be reflected by metallic materials. So fast forward to 1904, um, there was a patent issued to Christian Holzmeier who invented, quote, an obstacle detector and ship navigation device. It's a mouthful for what we now know as radar. Um, six years after that, um, a patent was issued uh, for a system which utilized a continuous wave radar signal for ground survey purposes to locate buried objects. And then in um, 1926, a patent was filed for using a radar pulse system. So um, essentially, uh, so continuous wave radar uh, basically utilizes the Doppler effect. So um, like when, when you're on a highway and there's a police car coming towards you with the sirens wailing and everything, it sounds high pitched. And then as it passes by, it drops in pitch. Well, basically that's how this radar worked where, so it, it transmits a signal at a known frequency. And then the receiver picks up that wave coming back, but picks up different frequencies. So it, it'll hit something that's moving away. It'll be a lower frequency when it returns, picks up something coming towards it. It'll be a, a higher frequency. So that was definitely good since before that, obviously there was nothing like that uh, in the world. However, it did have deficiencies. Now those deficiencies were pretty much um, cleared up upon the arrival of pulse radar. Now pulse radar basically sends out a, a pulse of electromagnetic energy and there's a time delay between the transmitted burst and the arrival of its echo back at the receiver. And this allows for much greater uh, resolution and the ability to determine distance. Um, one of the first use, uses of pulse radar for ground survey uh, was actually um, done in 1929. So like, yeah, 96 years ago um, to measure the thickness of a glacier in Austria. Um, <clears throat> so moving on, further, uh, further development of GPR uh, paused until the um, 70s and 80s uh, when military and government funded research led to a greater, uh, greater advances both in the technology of the radar, but then also the software which ran the radar. Uh, soon thereafter, uh, GPR technology became more affordable and thus became more available within the private sector. Um, so as, um, so, so when you look at the, the uh, applications in which uh, GPR can be used, it's, 
it's it's really a wide range. It, it's so in uh, construction engineering with uh, like if a uh, if they need to figure out if a freshly poured uh, pad of concrete or a wall is within code as far as the rebar spacing, we can scan that wall with a a little handheld radar unit and see whether or not pieces of rebar are uh, like every foot or every eight inches or, or whatever the code is. Um, within environmental uh, applications, uh, like um, Jerry touched on, uh, sinkholes. A lot of potential sinkhole uh, detection is done um, both uh, here in Pennsylvania and then also uh, GeoView is based out of Florida. And if you <laughs> if you look at a geologic map of central Florida, it closely, very closely resembles a slice of Swiss cheese. Um, and then also another environmental application is uh, looking for underground storage tanks at um, old, like former or currently existing uh, gas stations. Um, and then of course, also as Jerry was uh, mentioning, archeological applications um, with some of the antennas, um, the very uh, low frequency antennas, um, they, they use that for uh, geological profiling as well. Um, and then actually one other pretty cool, um, pretty cool application, which I myself did not firsthand uh, experience, um, but I saw these um, in the military. Uh, they actually had these, these uh, vehicles. Um, this, this vehicle is called a, a Husky, but basically on the front of it is this huge uh, radar antenna that they would use to find mines and IEDs um, while leading a, uh, a convoy. So, um, okay, so this, um, basically the next uh, batch of slides, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about how, how the radar works. Um, so with, with this figure, um, this basically this right here is the antenna, and um, this line represents the the ground. And so within within the box, um, which varies in size, I'll I'll get to the sizes of the antennas um, shortly. But within within the uh, box, there is a transmitter and a receiver. And so the, uh, the transmitter, it actually does not broadcast a, um, a signal in a, in a perfect circle. It basically looks, um, so if, if like straight down, uh, let me see, basically it, it looks, there's a, uh, a 90 degree angle that it looks forward and back but it's kind of angled. So it's like from, from directly vertical, it's 45 degrees to the front, 45 degrees to the back. When looking to the side, it's here again, uh, following a perfectly vertical axis down from the center of the antenna, it's looking 22 and a half degrees off to either side. So basically the footprint of this um, signal looks like an oval. Um, and so as, as uh, you go along um, and it hits a um, hits an object, actually I've got I've got some props here. Um, so if if you all can see this, um, so imagine this as a uh, uh, like a sewer pipe or some utility pipe um, buried underground. And this, uh, 
this is the antenna and then um, the uh, the signal coming from it. So as as the antenna comes across the uh, the pipe, the front of it will hit. Then it comes up to the top, goes over, and that creates a a uh, a parabolic wave where the the front end of the footprint hits first tracks up over the um over the whatever the object is and then comes back down sometimes if um if you're pushing the cart along and let's say the uh whatever the object is the top of it is flat like going um with, with an underground storage tank let's say or a, a septic tank um where um the the one you look at it from head on it it's a cylinder but then if you go from one end to the other that's a straight line the signal will go up flatten out and then sort of tail off at the far end um here again in in this so th this is a little uh, diagram of a coffin buried in a trench and you can see how um how there's this curve here where it hits where the uh, electromagnetic waves hit the coffin um and this actually shows another uh interesting little uh feature of radar um so in the uh in the diagram on the right hand side you can see in the in the picture um you can see the different colored strata of the ground well that that could that represents basically the the difference in density of the overburden like that they uh, dug through in order to bury the the coffin in that trench, and actually that is something that the radar can pick up. It can pick up the change in density uh, within the ground. So basically, you can see um, you can see clay lenses. Um, you can see uh, basically where like glacial sands um, are resting on top of bedrock um so anyway and then um in this in this picture this is actually a scan that i collected uh i was basically skinning a concrete floor looking for rebar um and the the rebar it's actually not up here it's it's the first biggest brightest reflector so like right in this right in this area is where the rebar is located and um then uh, there's my cursor um there's actually a second layer underneath this uh this top layer um but you can you can see very clearly that parabolic uh curve that is typical with uh, anomalies um, that show up on on radar. Now the the early systems they were definitely <laughs> big and cumbersome, like any sort of new technology way back in the day. I mean, you think of computers that had the stacks of cards and whatever that um, used them to to run programs. Basically, um, the, so currently the controller that I have for my system, um, it's essentially like a, like a tablet. Um, so really nice and small and uh, very, very uh, mobile. Back in the day when the systems were first uh, being developed and um, and used. They actually had 
a within that box that you see there in the picture, um, they had a scroll of paper that would spool across. And as, as the antenna was being dragged across the ground, what, what the antenna was seeing was actually being burned onto this paper. So it was essentially extremely time consuming, hard to, I mean, essentially higher education was necessary to figure out the the uh how to use um these systems nowadays um we have much <laughs> much more advanced technology the uh, three antennas that you see there in the picture the one on the right that's um i believe a 200 megahertz antenna which is basically used to um, look at uh, basically deep features. It's often used in uh, archaeological applications. Um, it can see down approximately uh, 30 feet given proper uh, ground conditions. The uh, antenna in the middle, that is a 2700 megahertz antenna and that that's actually the uh, same antenna that I used for uh, collecting that image of the concrete which uh, you saw earlier the uh, last antenna there the on the left that is um, I believe a, a, a 350 megahertz antenna which is very common for a wide range of applications um, from utility location, uh, location, sinkhole detection, and uh, archaeological um, applications as well. So the key with investigations using GPR is that you want to match the, the depth with um, the resolution. So increased frequency has decreased depth resolution. That means that the 2700 megahertz antenna there in the middle, you would not use that to go out and try to find something that's five feet underground because with 2700 hertz uh, signals, it's basically showing up everything that's uh, you know, within 18 inches of the, uh, the surface. And it's, it's showing, showing those features very clearly, um, very well. On the, on the flip side, decreased frequency equals increased depth resolution. So if you were trying to find a, uh, underground storage tank or utility, you would want to use a uh, a higher um or, or sorry a lower uh frequency antenna so uh typically from 300 like 300 400 megahertz um the they do make antennas that go as low as 10 megahertz um they both over in europe and here in the us they uh are very, very strictly uh, regulated by the government because it'll interfere with, uh, it, it'll cause radio interference. And uh, here's a, a slide that basically shows the, the applications, the, um, the frequencies, and the approximate depth that each of those antennas can look at. So um, basically a 400 megahertz antenna can see down to 12 feet. That's the uh, radar system that I have. Um, it's got a 400 megahertz antenna. If, <laughs> if I'm able to see down 12 feet here in Southeast Pennsylvania, that'd be an absolute miracle because um, basically of soil 
conditions. However, I, I take that down to Florida and I can see I can see very close to that maximum depth range. Um, here is actually my uh, my coworker who is um, using the 2700 megahertz antenna to map the rebar in the floor of um, the uh, at the World Trade Center uh, Museum. That was a, a very sobering uh, job site to, to say the least. Um, but we were there after hours and um, is really interesting to to just see the whole the whole site. But um, yeah, we we're there to just verify uh, some rebar locations. Um, just some uh, pictures here of various applications of uh, of radar from being towed with a ATV um, to being pushed around on a cart. Actually, the the cart that I have, it pretty much looks like a uh, a lawnmower. Um, so it's pretty pretty easy to, to uh, haul around. Um, so one of the things that uh, a lot of clients that I have ask is how deep is it? Unfortunately, it is not very easy to say, um, you know, how, like it's, oh, it's exactly three feet. Basically what we're seeing on the screen is a travel time from when the uh, radar signal is emitted to when the reflection comes back. So it's um, it's measured in nanoseconds. So to determine the depth, um, you need the the speed of the radar signal traveling through the host material. The speed is the the speed is controlled by the dielectric constant of the host material. So the dielectric constant basically represents the speed of electromagnetic waves through uh, specific materials. Um, so as an example, air has a dielectric constant of one and the signal can travel close to the speed of light. You can see with water, it's 81 and the signal has slowed considerably. <clears throat> so uh, short of actually scanning over an anomaly and then pulling out a probe and probing down to hit it and getting the exact depth, it's it's not um, it's not the the depths that we get with radar are not a reality but an estimate. Now, um, here's a list of the dielectric constants of um, just a, a variety of materials that we would uh, be surveying over. Um, typically what I am surveying over, I would say the, the dielectric constant ranges between five and 12. Um, it's, it, it really varies uh, from site to site, but um, essentially we, when we are surveying, um, basically get a, a really good idea of the ground conditions um, that uh, we're looking at and are able to, to make a, uh, a really good, um, I hate to say <laughs> guess, but it, I mean, yeah. So with, um, with any survey, there are, um, things that affect the data quality. Now, in the top image here, it's it's interesting. You, for 
a number of reasons. First of all, um, you see the the little arrow pointing to the metal plate at the surface. When you go over metal with a radar antenna, you get this ringing that basically goes down the entire uh, profile of um, of the screen. So if there's an anomaly below it, you're not really going to see it. But I mean, it, it's basically that that piece of metal is a manhole cover. So you're talking about like a several hundred pound chunk of metal sitting there. The other interesting thing to look at here is, um, so you see the variation in the, the um, signal returns here. And then over here, it just sort of um, fades out. This is, so this is a, uh, a cross section of a, a roadway, like the shoulder of a roadway, and then it goes into grass. This here is actually the result of um, salt that had been put down during the winter and just heavy amounts of salt. So uh, like places like New England, um, you will find that there's just a lot of, uh, it, it, it affects the signal return. Um, so it's kind of harder to get clean, uh, clean signals like you see here uh, where the grass is. And then another, um, another effect or a, another, uh, well, yeah, ba basically another issue is you can see the effect of standing water on the, uh, on the signal going through. It, uh, the amplitude gets um, quite, quite large, quite thick, has a similar effect here as the, as the metal where um, it's thick banding and just repeats, kind of echoes the whole way down. Um, so anyway, I will, that, that's, that's basically the, the nuts and bolts of how the radar works. Um, and now move into uh, some of the more <laughs> interesting things, which I uh, think uh, you all have been patiently waiting for, which, um, and I've had a number of people ask, ask me this on job sites. They ask me if I uh, see dead people. As a matter of fact, that is one of the things that we do a considerable amount of is cemetery surveys and uh, locating undocumented um, uh, grave sites where headstones may have been removed or um, relocated. Um, so this this first uh, this first case here that I want to uh, tell you about, um, it's the, the site um, you can see there on the, on the right-hand diagram, basically the site was surrounded to the north, east, and south by a, uh, an established uh, cemetery. Now the current owners wanted to sell the property um, but there was a concern that there were unauthorized graves that might be present within the property. Um, and uh, one, one thing uh, real quick to uh, tell you. So in that uh, figure on the right, you can see the fine crosshair pattern. That is... Uh, basically, the pattern that that's a grid that we set up to collect radar, um, and then there's also a, a, a 
metal detecting uh, technique, uh, we use a um, basically a huge elect electromagnetic antenna. It's a EM61 um, survey, which, yeah, it's essentially just a ginormous metal detector. Um, so with, with a uh, radar um, grid, we will run parallel lines in um, either going north, south, or east, west, depending on site conditions and what the best layout would be. With the other, with the uh, electromagnetic um, metal detector, that would be both north, south, and east, west, um, but at a wider profile. So anyway, um, so the conclusions of this uh, survey were that um, the, the buried graves um, that would be associated with casket burials do not appear, they, they didn't appear to be present uh, within the project site. Um, there were, however, 40 uh, isolated anomalies that, um, that were found and the highest concentration of them were to the south of the site. Uh, you can see there with all the uh, blue dots. Um, and they, they um, occurred at two, two levels, two depths. Um, so you can see here the, the shallower anomalies and then the deeper ones here. Um, this within the green circle is a buried uh, pipeline, which you can see running diagonally through uh, through the site. Um, so at any rate, um, it's it is possible that some of the buried objects were associated with um, not fully decomposed remains that were sort of buried in a uh, like they they had a shroud type burial. So. Um, but it, it wasn't possible without physical confirmation um, to know whether or not these anomalies were uh, basically man-made or natural. So whether they're caskets or vaults or um, something like a, a tree root or a large rock. So basically we went back to the site and 12 of the 14 locations that we had seen were then, um, they were picked to be uh, probed with a hand probe to a depth of six to seven feet. Um, with the objective being to either identify a buried object or a uh, or loose soil, which would also give a similar uh, radar return. Um, but only one, one hard object was discovered at a depth of six feet uh, based on, um, but based on the, on the hand probing, um, like the response to the hand probe, it actually appeared to be a tree root. Um, so in this instance, no, no graves were encountered. Uh, the second case, is basically a very similar um, situation where there were um, the the site was adjacent to an existing graveyard, um, but a limited number of graves actually still had uh, headstones, and so there's a concern that additional uh, graves might be present, um, and so radar was collected um, in north-south uh, transects, uh, space two and a half feet apart. Um, and essentially here you can see um, the suspected buried graves. Uh, these here in green are um, suspected graves. Uh, there were headstones on the surface. So it's very likely that these actually were graves. 
Uh, these over here, it was not not known uh, what specifically those anomalies were. Um, so went back to the uh, to the job site to do uh, probing um, to verify our findings. And um, actually no graves were identified um, and that the anomalies that we saw were most likely uh, tree roots. And this is when the client informed us that the area where, that we had been surveying had once been forested. So there are a lot of tree roots there. Now, this, uh, this story, uh, this project was actually really uh, kind of an incredible story. Um, so King High School in Tampa, Florida, um, the, this survey was completed uh, back in 2019 um, and it actually made national headlines. So in the early 1940s, um, before the school was around, um, the city of Tampa opened a cemetery that, um, and records indicated that it was basically an African-American indigent cemetery. So, um, then in, in uh, 1957, a 40 acre parcel of the overall plot was sold to a private entity who two years later sold it to the local school district. Now, it was written into the deed that there had been some portion of it that was a cemetery, but it, it may not have been completely clear, but basically those details sort of slid, uh, slid to the side. So at any rate, um, GFU went out there to conduct a survey. And uh, once again, we were collecting these uh, transects on a north-south um, pattern. And the so I, I've mentioned that a number of times. The, the reason for collecting uh, transects so close together is that we are then able to create a 3D image of the, um, of the site. So um, just see where I am here. Yeah, so basically this is, uh, these are some pictures from the site. And as a, um, a guy who is out in the field pretty much 90% of the time, well, 100% of the time doing field work, this site, it, it's like a geophysicist dream, just nice mowed grass, perfectly smooth and no hurdles to jump over. But um, actually, let, let me get back to um, what I was saying about a 3D grid. The, imagine, if you will, a, uh, a piece of uh, baklava. And basically, you take that piece of baklava and you slice it vertically into really thin slices. That's essentially what each one of those transects are that we collect with a radar. And then imagine taking all of those slices and then compiling them back together. So now what you're able to do is actually peel back the horizontal layers and have a top-down view of any anomalies that might be there. In this case, ground up pistachios. Now, the cool thing about it is that as you go down, 
at certain depths, you can start to see the bumps and deformations within the phyllo dough that indicate, oh, there's something down there. And then you finally pull back that one layer and there are the ground up pistachios. So anyway, here, here is the overall site. There was a section to the north that was uh, investigated, but the primary area of importance was down in the south, um, specifically the area within the red uh, rectangle there. Um, that's the suspected boundary of the uh, cemetery. So what was uncovered here, here is one of those. So it, imagine, like I said, with the phyllo dough, one slice or with the baklava, one slice of the baklava, this is essentially what one of those, you know, it would look like. It, in this case, it's, um, The, the, the purple uh, rectangle there, the, um, the dotted rectangle, that is approximately 70 feet in length. So what we have there are approximately 15, 16 anomalies lined up. Um, and these actually did turn out to be uh, graves. Now here, here are some of the, here's a result from taking those slices, piecing them together and peeling back the layers from the top down. Um, you can see, so in this area, um, and I'll, I'll go back a few slides to bring this out, but it says suspected uh, drainage pipes. You can see how all these pipes are pretty much there on one level. That would be all of these right here. Th this, this is at uh, 2.7 feet. Go down an additional two feet and you actually start to see the rows of graves um, that were uncovered. Here's a, a better image of it. Um, so on the uh, on the left hand side, um, that is a slice from uh, four to 4.8 feet deep. And you can start to see the, the rows of uh, graves here. Um, this, this figure over here on the right, that's from uh, 4.8 to five and a half feet deep. And you can see that the, uh, the graves are showing up uh, pretty clearly there. Um, and then these are the results from the northern portion of the site, where there actually weren't really any, um, no, no graves were found. There were some uh, buried areas of buried debris, a uh, buried uh, structure, but no, uh, no graves were detected there. Um, and you would uh, heard me earlier mention um, the uh, metal detecting uh, antenna being used in conjunction with GPR. This actually is a little uh, case study to show the importance of using both of those together, um, especially in certain types of surveys. This survey happened to be an underground storage tank that um, or a search for underground storage tanks at an old uh, gas station. Um, they knew that the USTs were around, but um, they couldn't 
verify where specifically they were. So here, here are the results that showed up from the um, from the metal detector. So you can see this this it, it looks like a huge area of activity. A lot of that is due to the fact that the ground surface was reinforced concrete. So you're going to have a lot of <laughs> a lot of interference. But this um, let me see this area here of more sort of more uh, uniform high amplitude returns indicated that's probably where the tanks were located. So um, run over that area with radar and actually in the next picture the the um, the profile that uh, the orientation of that uh, image that I'm going to show you is coming uh, straight straight up across this area. Um, so you can see the two metal USTs here and the areas of reinforced concrete here, just uh, higher amplitude and little um, indications where the rebar is located. But interestingly, Underneath it were buried three fiberglass USTs, which essentially the uh, the metal detector obviously would not have uh, picked up. So um, I think, ah, yeah. So that basically that is um, that's the end of uh, case studies and and uh, talking about the. Uh, ins and outs of how uh, the radar works. Um, so I'll just briefly tell you about some of the cooler uh, locations where I've worked. This uh, picture actually happens to be from um, an archeological site. It was a, uh, it's a lighthouse that I believe was completed um, a couple of years before the outbreak of the Spanish-American War. Um, it is on the island of Culebrita, which is basically a small island off of a slightly larger island off of Puerto Rico. Um, and my coworker and I were down there looking for um, the old uh, cistern and any sort of uh, channels that led to and from to the cistern and uh, to the lighthouse and uh, other outbuildings there. Um, so it was it was quite quite an incredible location to be working at. A little painful seeing that view while completely sweating and feeling miserable and not being able to get down there easily. Um, but in the end, um, it was it was a really, really cool uh, location to work at. Um, and then uh, actually, um, let me see here. I guess that's, that's the end of the presentation. But um, basically, the other, uh, the other thing that um, Jerry mentioned was <laughs> doing radar uh, inside a six foot forced sewer main. That was a, um, that was an experience. So it was down in uh, Washington DC. Um, the, uh, it was a six foot forced sewer main running under East Potomac Park. So where a lot of the uh, cherry blossom trees were right along the Potomac River. What they had discovered was that there was some raw sewage that was uh, leaching out into the river. And so basically what they did, they shut down the flow, cleaned out the, uh, the sewer main to the best of their ability for approximately I think it was about 3,000 feet worth of uh, sewer line that was uh, 
cleared out and they um we had ventilation running got all suited up went down there with the uh with a small uh radar antenna that um had shown you earlier and there were areas along the wall of this reinforced sewer line where the concrete had worn away the rebar was starting to show and so there were certain areas along this uh, 3000 foot length where we basically were running uh, we were collecting radar on a three dimensional grid to basically see how how thick the walls of the uh, the sewer main were and to what extent uh, sections of it would have to be uh, replaced, fixed, et cetera. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much the, uh, it's pretty much all I have. So hope I haven't uh, put anybody to sleep. <laughs> If you got any questions, put them in the chat there. We'll, we'll ask Peter the questions if they appear on there. Appreciate the use and for finding grades. What does this cost to hire? How much are your services, Peter? Ah, uh, well, um, it, it varies on, um, the uh, the size of the area to be um, surveyed, um, I can I can put my uh, the contact information for my coworker who does most of the estimates. Um, so I I can uh, put his information in there, the uh, the office phone number and whatnot, and um, they'll be able to, he'll be able to. Uh, give some good ideas of uh, costs. Yeah, Andrew asked a similar question about coming to York County to do a, try to find the uh, a lost iron furnace. <laughs> so. I tell you what, that would be uh, pretty cool, especially with that uh, salamander that you showed me after uh, my first time out there. It'd be really cool to uh, find one of those with a radar. Yep. I think Andrew has another furnace in mind in York County, though he's been looking for. Okay. In the eastern part of York County, south. Okay. End. So anyway, I'll... see a question there. Uh, let me see. Have I been involved in any projects that were specifically geological? Uh, yes. Um, so actually, I. When I first started out working in geophysics, I was working for a company that is more local, and we would do a lot of uh, sinkhole surveys. Um, there was uh, there was one area; it was a huge warehouse going up. I'll never forget this. Um, we we're out there investigating a uh, a small depression as they were uh, putting this um, warehouse up, and. Uh, we're we're talking with the client and some of the other uh, managers there on site, and a um, one of those larger uh, forklifts goes driving by, and then all of a sudden I hear yelling. I turn around. Well, it turns out one of the front tires of the forklift had fallen into a new sinkhole. <laughs> so <laughs> that moment where you see the scope of the job just expand. But um, yeah, it I've done a lot of uh, sinkhole detection as far as uh looking for um depth to bedrock or anything like that um i haven't done any of that type of work here using radar okay any other questions did you say how deep the how deep in the ground the gpr can reach so that that varies on um, the size of the antenna and the um, ground conditions. So in ideal conditions, um, it can see down the, 
there's a 10 megahertz antenna, which um, is pretty large. It can see down, I would say in excess of 90 feet. Um, typically what, what I'm using, um, I can see down about uh, six to eight feet uh, with conditions around here uh, in Southeastern uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so it, it varies. But it's it's uh, definitely, I, I would say, uh, shallow subsurface. Uh, there's a question about what technology do satellites use to see groundwater or use to predict droughts? Oh, <laughs> that's a very good question. And actually, I, I think that uh, that question is a bit bit outside my uh, area of expertise. So, okay, but wish I wish I could give you a, a better answer than that. We'll have to talk to NASA about that one, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we've Peter and I have had some good experiences, and. Uh, uh, we were searching for a cemetery uh, last time we were together, and unfortunately, the survey showed uh, no burials where we were suspecting things. Uh, I guess we just always don't. Uh, we always don't uh, get what we wish for. You want to put your contact in there, Peter, before we leave? Uh, yes, yes. I'm doing that now. I was wondering, have you uh, ever been involved in projects where, like, uh, like side thinking of the borough of Dunn County, but also our local school district, where they know they have water leaks? Can you see where the pipe is and whether there might be standing water, say, to, in one area around the pipe? You know, I actually, I actually have been involved in a job like that. Um, water main break under a uh is actually a new addition to a, a building and uh basically it washed out a lot of the soil and whatnot that was underneath um underneath that slab um so yeah potentially that that could be uh that could be something that i'd be able to figure out like if there's a void underneath the um underneath the the concrete slab yeah okay well thank you again peter for agreeing to come on board although it cost me a, a sub and a french fry for your lunch um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's fine I, i'm uh glad to be able to do this i'm glad you asked me and uh yeah is is good to be able to pass on information regarding ground penetrating radar yeah, this is our first uh, gpr type of uh, program so you you laid the foundation for it oh boy uh, sort of thing <laughs> uh all right uh uh what a, hey melanie yep Hey, uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, people that live in New Oxford area next Monday better better be aware of some hazardous things happening in New Oxford at the library next Monday at one o'clock. Sure thing. New Oxford's going to erupt with volcanoes, and we're going to shake the town with earthquakes. <laughs> so uh, I know we have one New Oxforder in here. Uh, he better be getting his hard hat on and be prepared because. Uh, Things are going to happen in New Oxford at one o'clock next next uh, Monday. So if you're in the area, stop down to the New Oxford Library and uh, and catch a forty five minute show on uh, volcanoes and earthquakes, sort of thing. So uh, I believe that's going to be it for tonight. Uh, unless somebody has something else you want to bring up. Um, 
Uh, I'm just thinking if there's anything else in my head, I don't think there is tonight anyway. <laughs> but but uh, I know there's a lot of jokes coming off of that one. But uh, <laughs> uh, everybody have a good, uh, we, we won't see you for about a month because of July 4th uh, holiday coming up. And uh, if you do come out to uh, Mary Ann Furnace Thursday night, hopefully the weather uh, cooperates with us. Uh, you'll see some pretty cool stuff, I think. So uh, anyway, thanks for joining us. You know, you have anything you want to say? Uh, not much besides thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Peter, so much. Congratulations on your first Zoom, it sounds like. <laughs> uh, a successful one at that. And um, everyone have a safe and happy uh, beginning of summer and holiday. All right. We will see right. you the next time in uh, later July. So take Bye. care, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks again, Peter. So yep. long.